Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the vineyard. How's everyone doing? In case you missed it, the sun is actually shining. So exciting to see the sun. Well, if you are visiting with us today, we want to welcome you here to the vineyard. We're glad that you found us. Uh, my name's Brett. I'm the senior pastor here. And it is so good to be together tonight. So if you are visiting for the first time, we have a gift that we would love uh, to give to you. It, we have a couple on the back table there, also um, on the connection counter out in the lobby. Uh, it's just got a gift in there, some information about us here at the Vineyard, uh, some really good Dove chocolate. So please help yourself to one of those bags if you have not received one. Um, Tonight, you were greeted by Deb and Debbie. So if you, easy to remember, just remember one name. Um, if you have any questions, they are back there ready and willing to answer any questions you may have. So please seek them out. Uh, before we move into tonight's worship, uh, we are going to go through just a few announcements. And you can open up your bulletin that you received. Inside that, a couple things you have, um, a giving envelope. If you'd like to give a financial gift to the vineyard, you can put it in that envelope, uh, fill it out, seal it up, and drop it in the little basket on the back table. And we also have in there a connection card, so you can just set this to a side right now. We'll get to that in one moment. But on the right hand or left-hand side of the bulletin, some announcements we're going to go through. First and foremost, uh, if you had signed up for Vineyard Camping Weekend, um, those payments are due for that weekend. Sites, if you have a campsite, it's $75. If you rented a cabin, it's $150. You can put details about that as it gets closer. The other thing we have going on is the Tioga County National Night Out. This is a uh, countywide initiative um, led by the Tioga County Sheriff's Department. They are doing, once a year, a, a community event. This year, it's in Island Park, Glossburg, on Tuesday, August 3rd, from 6 to 9. Um, we are going to be part of that. We're going to give away popcorn. We're going to give away cotton candy. And we have um, a few carnival games that we're going to run for this event. So if you are interested in helping with that event, please mark that on your connection card as well. And you'll get additional information. Um, kids 7 to 12 years old are invited to a Courage and Compassion Kids Day Camp held at His Thousand Hills. Um, that will be August 9th through the 13th. The cost is $50 per child. It runs from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. If you are a parent of a child from 7 to 12 years old and want more information, on the back table is a little card like this. Um, gives you all the information you need, plus how to register for that camp. We're just getting the word out for His Thousand Hills about that upcoming camp. And then last announcement is... Um, our annual baptism service is coming up August 29th at Three Springs, uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We do a worship service followed by our baptism celebration and then a big picnic style uh, dinner. So if you are um, planning on attending that service, please mark it on your connection card uh, tonight. Also, if you are considering baptism um, and just want to talk or have questions about that, please seek myself out um, or Carolyn and we will make a time to sit down and talk with you about um, what it means to be baptized um, at the vineyard. So you can mark that as well if you're interested in baptism on the connection card. And I, one last announcement is we have an opportunity to raise some funds for our coming home campaign by working a gate at the Tioga County Fair. Um, so what I've done is put a schedule of um, times and shifts that are available for us to work. If we can work one gate for the four days and cover every shift, we'll make about $1,200. And with our matching gift, we'll get another $1,200. So for $2,400, um, we, we could raise $2,400 for that. So I'm going to set this on the back table as well. You can take a look at it. The dates are well, actually, we've got two days full. So we're looking for some people to do Friday, August 13th, and Saturday, August 14th. So I'll put that there. You can take a look. And please write your name next to a slot if you are available to do so. And with that, we are going to take out those connection cards. 
um, we stay connected through this card. So if you have, um, if you're new or visiting, please give us as much information on the front as you would like to give us. Um, regular attenders, just your name is fine unless you've changed any information. On the back, we have a place for prayer requests, praise reports, and then to sign up for any of those events that we've talked about. Um, you can do it on this card. Also, if you're tech savvy, on the bottom right-hand side of the bulletin, you can scan that QR code, and it'll bring up a digital um, connection card for you to fill out right from your phone. You can do either of those. We're going to put 60 seconds on the clock so that you can fill those cards out. And for those joining us tonight on Facebook Live, um, in a few moments you'll see several links um, populating under this video feed. Uh, the first one will be um, our digital connection card. Second one will be to tonight's bulletin. And then the third one would be to our giving platform. If you'd like to give a gift to the Vineyard online, you can do through that through that platform. Those completed cards you can put on the big basket on the back table as you leave uh, the service this evening. And with that, I'm going to invite you all to stand as we prepare for worship. Um, I, I do want to say last week I was away for the weekend. Um, taking We took the youth group to a event called Project Timothy, and... Uh, Man, what a five days of amazing ministry and watching kids uh, really go for it. And so this, la this, uh, this year we really focus on just the, the fact that God speaks to us and he gives us insights into all sorts of things. And so the kids spent each day really focusing on prophetic ministry. Um, and so one of the things that the very last day I just sensed the Lord was saying to me, and, and I felt like it was for them, but I also feel like it's for us now, and I've kind of been meditating on this throughout uh, the week and really diving into it, but I got the Lord, a uh, sense from the Lord that he said, um, the choicest of wines begin by the pressing in of grapes, and, and the, the thought that just keeps resonating me with me is, you know, as we press into the Lord he does more and more within us. And so I, I just want to share that tonight as we begin to worship, as we go through the message, uh, invite you and encourage you to press in to Jesus, press into to who he is, and just invite him uh, to produce uh, more fruit within you. So Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here. We thank you for this place in which we can worship uh, who you are, God. And Lord, I pray that as we come in to this place tonight, as we, uh, as we sing songs to you, Lord, um, God, would you show up? Lord, as we press in to who you are, as we press in to who you want us to become, would you show up through your spirit, God? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you bring us words? We just invite you, God, to reign in this place, to reign in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just set a fire and a desire within us to press deeper into who you are. In your holy name we praise and thank you. Amen. Close your eyes for just one second. If you had a hard week, I don't mean a bad week necessarily, but a hard week, if it took a lot out of you, raise your hand. I had a hard week. And I'm incredibly glad to be here worshiping with you. And for those of you that raised your hands, you know what I'm talking about. You overworked, you, uh, something bad happened, something good happened, but you're tired at the end. So we're going to sing some songs 
about who God is. Jesse's going to preach about Jesus being the good shepherd, about his sacrifice and his willingness to step into the gap for us. We're going to sing a song called Graves in the Gardens. I wish there was a line in here that says, you turn hard weeks into worship. Well, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Hearing your love, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Sing, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing.
Some of you are, you're feeling something new. You're feeling something maybe for the first time. And you're wondering, what is that? What is that? What am I feeling? What is God calling me into right now in this moment? So I just take you, I just invite you to take a few moments. Close your eyes and reach out and say, God, what's going on? What are you doing in me? What are you doing in others around me? And where's my part to play in all of this? A thousand times I've failed, still your mercies remain. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting, your light will shine with become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Your will my 
we just thank you for this opportunity to come and to gather and to worship you, Lord. We just, we praise your holy name, God. We just, what a privilege to be able to gather in one room and just lift our voices in unison to you, God. You so, so deserve our humble praises. God, I just pray that you'll be with Jesse tonight as he brings the word, Lord, and just speak through him to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Be with our um, nursery workers upstairs and our sound and our projection people, and just, just bless everyone who's here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. And going through, uh, I am still me. Tonight we're going to look at, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 11 through 15, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. The hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. So the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money, doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. The image of shepherds and sheep is found often throughout the Bible. What is it that Jesus is really saying as he describes himself? pray. Father, I pray your wisdom, Spirit, you so to begin, uh, I'd like to give you a little background on shepherds. In the beginning of the biblical narrative, uh, shepherd, shepherding was considered to be a noble profession. Um, they're mentioned early in Genesis chapter 4 where Jabal is called the father of those living in tents and raising livestock. In nomadic societies, where everyone, whether a sheik or a slave, was a shepherd, uh, the wealthy sons of Isaac and Jacob tended flocks, we see in the book of Genesis, and the priest Jethro, the priest of Midian, employed his daughters as shepherdesses in the book of Exodus. But when the 12 tribes of Israel migrated into Egypt, they encountered a lifestyle that they were not familiar with. The Egyptians were agricultural. And they did not hold sheep or livestock in high regard as they tended to destroy flocks. So... All right. Um, yeah, they tended to destroy crops. So disputes between shepherds and, um, and farmers were quite common. 
uh, and eventually disdain for the profession uh, birthed stereotypes and the status was eroded. Um, in general, shepherds became seen as second-class citizens and they were untrustworthy. In addition to losing its vocational appeal, shepherds were also stripped of basic civil rights. They could not fulfill judicial offices and they were not admitted in court as witnesses. To buy wool, milk, or a kid from a shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it was stolen property. So Jesus enters onto the scene into this bias and announces that he is the good shepherd. And we see in true Jesus fashion, he is aligning himself with those on the fringes of society. I have an excerpt titled The, jo the Job Description of a Shepherd by Marjorie Kinney. Shepherds were in charge of the day-to-day -day care of the flock. They provided basic food, water, shelter, and prote protection. He knows what's best for the flock in every season and where to find it. He could find water even in a drought, and he plans the construction of the sheepfold and erects short-term shelter while in the field. The shepherd daily lays his life down for the sheep. The shepherd deals with the outside world on behalf of the flock. The shepherd is first responsible to the owner of the sheep. The owner has the master plan for the flock. The shepherd is entrusted with the details, additions to and subtractions from the flock, the time and place for fleecing and wool sale, and he selects and trains assistants and helpers. He discharges them if they create harmful situations or cause any harm to come to the flock. The shepherd also foresees danger. He trains the flock to know and follow his voice. This is his first line of defense. To wayward sheep, he administers discipline and takes preventative measure to correct fatal tendencies. He researches and develops methods and measures to improve the present flock and prepares for future flock needs. The shepherd leads and guides the flock. Because sheep tend to overgraze, the shepherd moves them on to fresh pasture. To do this, he may have to lead them through danger. Enemies, marauders, hazards like wind and weather, mountains and gorges. His experience is a prime factor. He's been this way before and he's not surprised by danger. He knows what to do and how to proceed in dangerous situations. And the shepherd, finally, is the overseer of the flock. The flock is the focus of the shepherd. He's responsible for their physical well-being, so he sets the pace. He's aware of the particular needs of each sheep. There are ewes, heavy with new life, lambs, inexperienced and frisky, there are young rams, stubborn and territorial, the aged and sickly, those needing extra attention, and the wayward who oppose everything, even to their own best interest. Shepherds study the breed. He learns the strength and weaknesses and personality of each one, and a thriving, peaceful flock is his blessing and reward. The shepherd's primary focus is on the well-being of the sheep. Now, a few characteristics of sheep. Sheep have no natural form of defense. They are left to the protection of the shepherd and they are completely dependent on him. Sheep constantly produce wool. The more they shave off, the more they grow. They are picky eaters, preferring fresh grass they will eat down to the root, if left too long to graze, will destroy the food source, and they are constantly in need of new pasture. Sheep know their master's voice. Often many flocks and shepherds would come together for safety or company, and the shepherd would only need to call his flock, and they would follow him without getting mixed up 
in the larger crowd. Sheep are intelligent, actually ranked fifth behind pigs, elephants, dolphins, and primates. Tests demonstrate that sheep recognize individual human and sheep faces. They can remember them for years. Sheep are able to differentiate emotional states through facial characteristics. They have shown problem-solving skills and have been taught to learn their names. They are friendly and social. They enjoy living and growing together in small groups. They naturally flock together because sheep love sheep. So they're basically defenseless social animals, completely dependent on the shepherd for even their most basic daily needs. Now the Bible gives us several great examples of shepherds, Moses being my favorite. But we see Moses, as he grows up in Egypt, in royalty, right? He would have picked up on the customs of, of the time and would have had this lowly perception of a shepherd. But after he kills an Egyptian in an attempt to save his own people, he flees into the desert and he becomes a shepherd. And it's during this time that God calls Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. In Exodus 3, verses 1 and 2, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. So Moses and God then have this conversation back and forth as God calls Moses out to be his man. He's to be the one to lead Israel out of slavery from Egypt. And Moses is pretty sure God has the wrong guy and convinces him to find somebody else. God does not. And Moses goes from shepherding sheep in the mountains to shepherding God's people out of slavery in a dramatic confrontation of Pharaoh and the power of God. So we see Moses as a shepherd fighting for God's flock in the plagues of Egypt. We see Moses as a shepherd leading the people Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery across the Red Sea. We see Moses as a shepherd providing for the people by intervening to God to provide manna for sustenance. And we see Moses as a shepherd providing the Ten Commandments as a safe boundary within which to reside. Moses has all the characteristics of a good shepherd. He sets the pace as Israel walks through the desert. He handles legal and civil disputes among the people. He appoints others to help him in his tasks, in turn helping them to grow as leaders and shepherds. He hears from God, the true owner of Israel, and obediently follows his counsel. Moses has Israel's best interest at heart and answers first and foremost to God. He takes care of his flock. He strengthens the weak. He searches for the lost. He rules lovingly and gently. He gathers and protects the sheep, and he gives his best to the sheep. In Psalm 23, we read David describing God as a shepherd. And as I read through this psalm, I would invite you to put yourself in the position of a sheep, no matter how humbling that may be. And with God as your shepherd, knowing the job description of the shepherd, pick out the parallels in a relationship with God provides. David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows, and he leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength, and he guides me along right paths. 
bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. And you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. This imagery begins to make some sense as, as we draw these parallels between God as our shepherd and between us as sheep. This brings us to David. He's another great example of a shepherd. He was the youngest of seven brothers, put in charge of tending his father's sheep. And when Samuel comes to anoint a king under God's direction, David isn't even invited to sit at the table. He was the youngest and least of them, foreshadowing Jesus' own humble beginnings. As David was the first shepherd king, Jesus would be the last. So God chose David as king, raising him from the lowest position of shepherd to the highest position over all Israel. But it was David's experience as a shepherd that he used to convince King Saul to allow him to fight and defeat Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, starting in 34, we read, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So David uses his experience as a shepherd to defeat this giant, Goliath. Using only the tools he would have had available to him in the field with the sheep. And like a good shepherd, David protects his flock from predators, the lion and the bear, that only intend to kill and steal and destroy the sheep. We also get a glimpse of David as king, protecting God's sheep, Israel, from their enemies. He was considered a good shepherd by caring for Israel in three specific ways, making intercession for them. In 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 and 2, we see David interceding on behalf of Israel to make amends and bring them back into righteousness. There was a famine during David's reign that lasted for three years. So David asked the Lord about it, and the Lord said, The famine has come because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. So the king summoned the Gibeonites. They were not part of Israel, but were all that was left of the nation of the Amorites. The people of Israel had sworn not to kill them. But Saul, in his zeal for Israel and Judah, had tried to wipe them out. So a little bit of background here. After the death of Moses, um, Joshua uh, becomes Israel's shepherd and uh, begins conquering the promised land. The Gibeonites were a group of people. They were descended from the Amorites. Uh, they're described as people who deceived the Israelites in order to protect themselves. So after the Israelites had defeated the cities of Jericho and Ai, many of the nearby Canaanites united to form a large army to fight Israel. But the Gibeonites took a different approach. They resorted to a ruse. They went out as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes, and all the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua in the camp 
and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. And the Israelites did not consult with God before agreeing to the treaty and fell for the Gibeonite scheme. The Israelites soon discovered they had been tricked and discussed how to respond. The leaders of Israel decided, we've given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. So this is what we will do to them. We let them live so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oaths we swore to them. And they continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the holy assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. The end of the account notes that that day, Joshua made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. In other words, the Gibeonites survived, yet they served as slaves to the Israelites for generations to come. The land of Gibeon would later be allotted to the tribe of Benjamin. King Saul broke this treaty that Joshua had signed and attacked the Gibeonites. And during the time of King David, the famine occurred in Israel. And when David asked the Lord about the famine, God said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house, and it is because he put the Gibeonites to death. To appease the Gibeonites, he put an end to the famine. Seven descendants of Saul were given to them to be put to death. And God healed Israel's land after that. So that's, a little, that's the, the background. These Gibeonites are such a problem, and killing them is also such a problem. Um, so David intercedes on Israel, on Israel's behalf to God, to end the drought, thus ending the famine. And we see David as the good shepherd uh, caring for Israel by mediating atonement for them. Uh, in 2 Samuel 21, continuing in verse 3, David asked, what can I do for you, and how can I make amends so, you, so that you will bless the Lord's people again? The Gibeonites responded, money can't settle this matter between us and the family of Saul, and neither can we demand the life of anyone in Israel. What can I do then, David asked. Just tell me, and I will do it for you. And they replied, it was Saul who planned to destroy us, to keep us from having any place at all in the territory of Israel. So let seven of Saul's sons be handed over to us, and we will execute them before the Lord at Gibeon and the mountain of the Lord. And all right, the king said, I will do it. So David is concerned with keeping the oath of Joshua not to kill the Gibeonites and ultimately restoring the favor of the Lord to um, Israel and, and then ending the the drought, which is causing the famine. Um, and then one more in, uh, in 2 Samuel 21, we see David as the good shepherd model compassion for Israel. Starting in verse 10, then Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, the mother of two of the men, spread burlap on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest season. She prevented the scavenger birds from tearing at their bodies during the day and stopped wild animals from eating them at night. And when David learned what Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went to the people of Jabesh Gilead and retrieved the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan. When the Philistines had killed Saul and Jonathan on Mount Gilboa, the people of Jabesh Gilead stole their bodies from the public square of Beth Don, where the Philistines had hung them. So David obtained the bones of Saul and Jonathan, as well as the bones of the men the Gibeonites had executed. Then the king ordered that they bury the bones in the tomb of Kish, Saul's father, at the town of Zela in the land of Benjamin. And after that, God ended the famine in the land. So David had compassion on Rizpah, uh, and he brought the remains of her family back home to give them a, a proper burial. And now we see David as this shepherd king points to the future shepherd king in Jesus. And Jesus steps in and announces that he is the good shepherd. And it's in reference to Ezekiel 34, 
which is a prophecy pointing to Jesus. And by claiming to be the good shepherd, he is essentially telling the Pharisees to whom he is speaking that he is the Messiah. Ezekiel 34, 7 through 12. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you abandoned my flock and left them to be attacked by every wild animal. And though you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves and left the sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds my enemy, and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and the sheep will no longer be their prey. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock, and I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that day of clouds and darkness. Jesus is announcing that he is the good shepherd, fulfilling that prophecy. Seeking and saving the lost, and calling all of humanity to himself. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, leads us to life abundantly, not only in the greenest pasture in heaven, but also here and now on earth. In John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, is a lamp to guide us through darkness. In John 8.12, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, comes to fight for us. In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Because God's children are hu human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, leads us to the Father. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, lays down his life for us in John 10, 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my father knows me, and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, ultimately restores us to the father. In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Jesus is the good shepherd, modeling for us compassion and mercy, empathy toward our neighbors. He's calling us out of darkness, sin, and slavery into a life of freedom, into his good and perfect will giving us not a set of laws to be followed rigidly and legalistically, but rather a relationship to be nurtured, to be growing towards, to live within the loving boundaries, not out of compulsion, but out of love and humility. Ultimately, laying down his life for us, 
in place of us dying so we would not have to and taking our punishment as his own. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, the lost sheep, the weak sheep, stubborn and confused sheep, the sheep that want nothing to do with him, or the sheep that deny he even exists or their own need for a shepherd. The good shepherd knows and he loves all of his sheep. Because the, the truth is, none of us really know why what we're doing here. We ask a dozen different people the meaning of life, and we'll get at least a dozen different answers. But we all have this inborn desire to belong. This desire to be known or to believe in something greater than ourselves. And that's what Jesus is offering us today. He's the one who will stand before us to fight our battles. And he is the one who will come behind us when our will gets weak and we've lost the strength to continue. He lifts us up, he guides us, and he protects us. And there is no one you would want on your side more than him, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you believe it or not. Jesus, as the good shepherd, cares deeply for you to the point of his own death. He knows you just as you are, and he's still willing to lay down his life that you may live. You're not too lost. You're not too dark or dreary. You're not too evil. These walls won't burn when you walk in. This place was made for you. Jesus was meant for you. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've wandered off or get distracted. We get caught up in life. Sometimes it's important. Sometimes it's worthy. But it's not the most important thing. And often causes us to take our eyes from the shepherd the one who leads us. I have a basset hound. Uh, while I don't, I don't believe he would blatantly run off with his tail in the wind, he will put his nose to the ground and he'll begin to follow some rabbit trail or another. And with all his intent, with all his purpose, He'll follow that trail. And before long, he'll look up and he'll be completely lost. Wandered off, far from home. And he didn't even know it was happening. Sheep are the same way. We are the same way. Some trails are dark and treacherous, and we obviously shouldn't be on them. But we go anyway. Some are noble and necessary, but without our shepherd to guide and protect us, they could easily become overwhelming, something we hadn't intended. Jesus is our shepherd, and we can trust him completely. We should know how he cares for us, and how he loves us, how he guides us and gives us boundaries for our protection, not to stifle our freedom. Think, think of a toddler just finding his legs, constantly exploring his new freedom, so unstable and yet so bold. But any good parent is going to block off the stairs. It's not because uh, with the intention of, of keeping something from that kid, but to protect them from the pain, the injury of falling down. Jesus is our shepherd, and we can look to him as our example. In this world where everyone is only concerned with getting theirs or what's in it for me, more is more, 
our shepherd shows us another way, one of compassion and sacrifice. If you want to stand out or be different from the rest, give something away or, or do something for free. Notice someone outside of our own little world. We offer encouragement, we offer help for our presence. Because the things the kingdom of God values are so simple, and yet they're often so far from our minds and hearts. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, lays down his life for us. God sent Jesus to reconcile our relationship with him. And Jesus came for us. Jesus was sent for us. He came for you. He was sent for you. We are his purpose. and He is our guide, our shepherd. So where else do we turn? Where else can we turn? Where else do we look for guidance, protection, for life, but to the one who was sent for us? Through this whole um, I Am series, we've been doing communion on a weekly basis. Uh, we have some on the table back here, or, or there's a basket up here if you haven't gotten yours. Jesus was sent, and he willingly died that we might be brought back into a good relationship with God. As that famous theologian, Bob Dylan, once said, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And we all serve somebody or something. And we're all following a shepherd. But is it the good shepherd? And as we take communion tonight, I'd like you to think about choices and words, actions over the past week. Who is it that you serve? You may be here tonight in like a wayward basset hound, find yourself slowly wandered off. The increments and decisions were so small, you might not have even noticed it happening. I invite you tonight to head home. Turn back. Turn your eyes to the good shepherd and choose to follow him all over again. Or you may be, you may be here having never made that choice. Having never accepted Jesus as your shepherd. And I invite you tonight to make that choice. We all follow something. Why not choose to follow the one who cares so deeply for you? Why not choose to follow the one who cares so deeply for you that he would die so that you might live? Follow the one who is sent for you. The one who only desires to give you life to the full. You are his desire, and you are his prize. We forget last week, forget yesterday. Today, God is calling, and today can be your day. And it's easy. We make it easy. Sorry, thank you, and please. Sorry for my sin. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Please reveal yourself in my life. Show me how to live. I 
accept God's gift, accept Jesus' sacrifice, and head home tonight. God, your Father is waiting patiently just for you. Amen. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of life had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens God in this moment. We invite you to stand and sing with us. There was a moment when the sky lit up. A flash of light was breaking through. When all was lost, he crossed eternity. The king of Oh 
like to give um, 